Professor John S. Dryzek and dear participants, good afternoon and namaste. Welcome to a very special webinar on deliberating climate justice. Before I start, let me briefly introduce NICE. Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement is an independent, apolitical, and non-partisan think tank which believes in freedom, democracy, and world free from conflict. We envision a world where sources of insecurity are identified and understood, conflicts are prevented or resolved, and peace is advocated. To talk on a very interesting topic of today, we have very distinguished professor, Dr. John S. Trajek. Dr. John S. Trajek is Australian Research Council Lottery, a laureate fellow and senior professor in the Center for Deliberative Democracy and Global Governance at the Institute for Governance and Policy Analysis. Before moving to the University of Canberra, he was a distinguished professor of political science and Australian Research Council Federation Fellow at the Australian National University. He's a fellow of the Academy of Social Science in Australia, former head of the Department of Political Science at the Universities of Warrington and Melbourne, and of the Social and Political Theory Program at Australian National University, and former editor of the Australian Journal of Political Science. Professor Dryjek holds a MS in politics from the University of Estates Clyde uh, in 1976 and a PhD in government and politics from the University of Maryland. Working in both political theory and empirical social science, he is best known for his contributions in the areas of democratic theory and practice and environmental politics. One of the instigators of the del deliberative turn in democratic theory, he has published five books in this area with Oxford University Press, Cambridge University Press, and Polity Press. His works in environmental politics range from green political philosophy to studies of environmental discourses and, moment, and movements to global climate governance. And he has published five books in this area, as I mentioned. He has also worked on comparative studies of democratization, post-positivist public policy analysis, and the history of philosophies of social science. His current research, funded by the Laureate Fellowship, emphasizes, emphasizes global justice, governance in the anthropology, and emerging efforts of instability in the earth science, and cultural variety in deliberative practices. Professor Dijek, once again, welcome to our program. Can you make your remarks in around 30 minutes, which will be followed by questions and answers. The program is streaming live on Facebook and several other platforms. We would like to request all our participants to drop their questions on Zoom chat or on a Facebook Live, or you can also tweet or WhatsApp your question if you want. Professor Dryzek, over to you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you for that very nice introduction. Um, what I'm going to try and do now is um, uh, share my screen and hope this works. Oops. Uh, okay. Is is that working? Yes, sir. It's visible. Okay. Excellent. Um, so the title of my talk is um, Deliberating Climate Justice, and uh, I'm, I've done a lot of work over the years in deliberative democracy, and so what I'm going to argue is that uh, uh, inclusive democratic deliberation is actually uh, essential to the pursuit of uh, climate justice. So, so what is climate justice? Well, um, uh, these... Yeah, I hope that worked. Um, so these people think that climate justice is a good idea. This is a social movement mobilization um, on behalf of uh, on on behalf of climate justice, and a lot and a lot of uh, social movements do use climate justice climate justice now as a as a slogan. Um, if we look at um, if we think if you look at these people, um, there are many academic theorists of climate justice. Um, so most of these people are philosophers, but they may be economists, um, political theorists too. Um, some of you may recognise um, Vandana Shiva as, as one of one of those um, in the top uh, the top middle of this of this slide. Um, uh, but all all, the, all these people have, have developed sort of more academic treatments of climate justice. Um, but then, what about uh, these kinds of people? Um, what about world leaders? What do they think about climate justice? And there, it's um, perhaps a bit harder to, um, to to find any any strong concern. But yet, what they think is obviously going to be um, extremely important. Um, what I'm going to argue, amongst other things, is that uh, uh, social movement activists, um, public intellectuals, and philosophers and other thinkers, um, but also uh, political leaders, um, need to be into more integrated into a more effective uh, deliberative system for climate justice. And I'm going to be building on uh, 
uh, this book um, called uh, Democratizing Global Justice, which I wrote, uh, which was published um, uh, in 2021, I'm co-authored with um, Anna Tana Soka. Um, and the, and there, uh, essentially, we, we deal with uh, two, two central cases in that book. Um, the first is the process which yielded the Sustainable Development Goals um, back in uh, 2015. Um, and the second is climate justice. So I'm going to be talking about climate justice today, but I think there are some things we can learn from the process which uh, yielded the Sustainable Development Goals. And actually, there are some positive lessons from that. Um, so what then, so what exactly is climate justice? Um, how do we define it? Well, um, justice in general, um, as any philosopher will tell you, um, covers the allocation of rights and benefits. So in other words, what people can claim as a matter of right or a matter of um, benefit that they're entitled to. Um, but it also uh, covers, ben sorry, duties and burdens. So who is under an obligation to respect um, these rights? Um, who is an oblig under an obligation um, to bear the burden of um, rectifying injustice? So that's um, what justice is in general. Um, but climate justice in particular can be a number of different things. And so what I've done um, um, on this slide is, uh, um, is, is list the things that, um, that uh, sorry, is, is this, um, I'm just wondering if you're getting a- Yes, a, we can get- A correct yeah, view. Yeah. Okay, the, the slides, yeah. Um, okay, so climate justice can be um, amongst other things, um, a concern for the most vulnerable. So when we we think of well, who's going to be most affected by um, climate change? And it's often people, um, uh, often people who are who are already vulnerable in other dimensions. Um, so um, so for example, um, uh, people living in uh, low lying island states in the Pacific, um, people living in uh, um, in Bangladesh who are vulnerable to um, sea level rise and associated intensification of um, of, of of storm activity. Um, uh, people who live in areas of, say, sub-Saharan Africa, which are subject already subject to 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 climate instability and, and drought. Um, so, climate justice is often thought of concern for the most vulnerable, and that obviously is um, a very defensible conception of it. But that's not all it means. Um, so, if we look at uh, other conceptions of climate justice, which are around in 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 global politics, um, uh, one of the most important ones is uh, an historical view. Of, of justice, of, of climate justice. And this was actually um, embedded in the, the foundation of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change back in 1992, which referred to the idea of common but differentiated responsibilities that different countries have, depending on their history of emissions. So differentiated responsibilities means that those who have emitted most in gr of greenhouse gas emissions are more responsible um, for for cutting back and doing something about um, about global climate change, um, and this um, was reflected in 1997 in the Kyoto Protocol, where it was only the Annex One countries, the rich countries, um, under any obligation to make cutbacks on emissions um, at, according, according to the Kyoto Protocol. Um, with time, uh, we see that the common responsibilities have been emphasised more. And so um, certainly in, uh, by the time of the Paris um, Conference of the Parties in, in 2015, uh, we saw more of a stress on not just the richer countries, but also the poorer countries um, um, having obligations to try and cut back emissions too. Um, and, but, but, the moral but the principle of, of, of differentiated responsibilities um, uh, of different countries is already is, is very strong. So for example, um, uh, uh, India Environmental Minister um, Javadeka in 2014 said, uh, when referring to the possibility of emissions cuts for India, he said, what cuts? That's for more developed countries. The moral principle of historic responsibility cannot be denied. So that's asserting that justice depends on historical responsibility. Um, but uh, uh, that's not all there is to to climate justice. So there are some people who, and that this, is, this is often um, ethicists who argue this, um, um, they say that the, the problem with the historical approach as embodied in UN negotiations is that it doesn't recognize that there are poor people in rich countries, but also rich people in poor countries and, and rich people in 
there are there are a number of rich people in poor countries who have built their own prosperity on a, his, on a history of um, emissions, of greenhouse gas emissions. And so um, those people should also be under similar obligations to to cut back. And so a cosmopolitan approach to global justice um, would really treat individuals as their units of uh, obligation and, and concern um, and irrespective of where they live. Um, so in other words, poor people living in rich countries would be would get just as much concern as poor people living in, in poor countries. Um, climate justice can also be intergenerational, that arguably it's um, it's extremely unfair that the present gener present generations are uh, emitting uh, greenhouse gas emissions and uh, emissions and affecting uh, uh, negatively affecting the well-being of, uh, of future generations. Um, climate justice can also mean fairness in the terms of trade. Now, you might think, well, what has this got to do with climate justice? Well, um, uh, on an ethical basis, perhaps not very much, but um, historically, when the, the United States has talked about justice in the context of climate change negotiations, it's, it's, it's always been forward-looking. And it's in terms of, well, we want to do something about uh, climate change, but we don't want to unfairly uh, hurt the United States in comparison to its competitors, such as China. So the United States has, has often tried to um, reject the historical conception of justice and, often, and, and think about a more, a more forward-looking conception of justice, which emphasizes fairness in the terms of trade, obviously extremely selective um, in its interpretation of what justice means. Justice can also be ecological. Um, so, for example, um, in Cochabamba, in Bolivia, in, in 2010, the Bolivian government hosted what was called the World People's Conference on Climate Change and the Rights of Mother Earth. Um, this suggests that the non-human world, um, in this case, Mother Earth, um, in, in, the, in Bolivia, um, had a claim to be recognized as, as, part, of, um, as part of justice. Um, and then finally, um, justice can also be a matter of the recognition of the marginalized. This is not just a concern for the marginalized, which can be paternalistic, um, but recognition of the full political standing and the rights of the marginalized um, to have a place um, in, um, in, in, in the social life of the world, in the political life of the world. Um, so those are the different, um, some of the different conceptions of, uh, of what climate justice might involve. Um, and what I would argue is that there are um, uh, there are multiple reasonable conceptions of justice. Now, I myself might think that some of these are more defensible than others, but other people might disagree with me as to which um, which ones are more important. Um, so, in the light of these uh, multiple conceptions of what climate justice means, well, what do, what do we do? Um, it's possible to um, assert that there's some easy and obvious answer out there. So. Um, I shared a platform a few years ago with um, Clive Hamilton, who is a leading Australian thinker on questions of climate change. Um, and he, um, he he basically disagreed with me. Um, he, he, the way he put it is that the, the ethical winds all blow in one direction um, and that, there, that really climate justice is not a hard problem. Um, it, it simply involves the, it, it involves the, the rich and uh, richer nations, um, richer individuals simply cutting back on, on their emissions. Um, I think it's not quite as simple as that, that there are, as I suggested, multiple conceptions in play. Well, should we then hand it over to, um, to philosophers to try and reason, things, reason through what justice involves? I mean, many of them sort of try to make a living um, by thinking about questions of justice. Um, uh, but the problem with philosophers is that they don't agree. Um, so if we hand it over to them, then we will never reach any resolution as to what um, what to do about competing conceptions of, just, of justice. Um, we can we might try to negotiate different conceptions of justice, and this is in a way this is what is already done at the global level um, in the global negotiations. So uh, different different countries involved in the negotiations bring different conceptions of justice to the table. I mean, I've already suggested that um, developing countries are much more likely to insist on a conception of uh, historical um, historical justice, um, whereas countries like the United States are much more likely to reject that historical notion um, and, and, and adopt a, a more forward-looking conception of justice. Um, 
so the but the problem well the problem we see in the negotiations is that these conceptions of justice are, are often de deployed strategically um in the, the in to serve the self-interest the material self-interest of the state making or the state or states that are making those uh claims about justice now just because they serve self-interest doesn't mean that they're necessarily uh um that they're, ne ne they're necessarily um um, indefensible. I mean, it's perfectly defensible for a, um, say, a low-lying island state uh, to argue that its conception of justice serves its own self-interest in survival, essentially. So, and that's that's perfectly defensible in ethical terms. But anyway, the, the general point here is that um, um, that uh, that we we do see negotiation. We do, we do see uh, conceptions of justice um, appearing in negotiations, um, but often they they do serve self-interest. Sometimes that self-interest is defensible, um, sometimes less defensible, as in the case of the, the, the United States traditionally. Um, well, finally, uh, we might try to um, deliberate, and this is really, I suppose, this is really where I come in. Um, and so, um, what I would argue is that this is the the, the most desirable, um, sorry, uh, uh, this, this is the most desirable approach to uh, to dealing with um, multiple reasonable conceptions of climate justice. Um, so what is um, what is deliberative democracy? Um, so I've got a quote on the slide. Um, it's which is from one of my former students, John Parkinson. Um, it's a way of thinking about politics, which emphasizes the give and take of public reasoning between citizens rather than the counting of votes or the authority of representatives. Um, it's sometimes referred to as a talk-centric as opposed to a vote-centric view of democracy, although it's not just talk that um, listening and reflection matter just as much as talk in a deliberative democracy. Um, um, I would argue that um, deliberative democracy is not just applicable at the local level, not just at the national level, um, but it can also be applied um, to global politics too, including global climate politics. And so I've done a lot of work on over the years on trying to figure out um, how exactly it can be introduced into global uh, global climate politics. It's not easy, um, but I would come to um, a few specific suggestions um, in a few moments. Um, but ideally, inclusive democratic deliberation can do a number of things. Um, in the context, especially when it comes to thinking about justice. Um, it, um, deliberative democracy should be able to empower the agents necessary to determine what justice should mean in any given context and how it should be implemented. Um, now, some agents uh, don't really need empowering any more than they are at the moment. Um, we, if we think of um, powerful states, um, uh, China, the United States, um, India, the European Union, um, they don't need empowering. They're already uh, empowered within the system. Um, corporations, um, large corporations and foundations are already uh, empowered within the system. Um, but then for some uh, other uh, sorts of um, agents, uh, much, uh, a, a much find, it, find it much harder to, um, uh, to, uh, to have a say in the system. So I'm thinking of... Uh, 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 here, um, for example, well, especially ordinary citizens. Where are the citizens of the world in these kinds of um, global processes? Um, especially when it, when thinking of climate justice, what about um, the poorer citizens of the world? Um, where are they? Um, the answer is often um, they're, they're not to be found. Um, and then somewhere in the middle, we find um, advocacy organizations um, arguing for effective action on climate change, or sometimes climate justice in particular, um, uh, uh, we find um, experts um, such as those organized in the intergovernmental panel on uh, climate change. You might think, well, uh, they, they do have a voice in the system, but often that um, often that voice uh, uh, doesn't. It's certainly not a decisive voice um, and it often sort of struggles to get heard um, in when it's when it comes up against the material self-interest of uh, more powerful players such as big corporations. Um, uh, big international organizations um, and uh, and powerful states. Um, so um, we can think about um, the, the roles of different sorts of agents um, in, in deliberative systems. And I'll come back to the idea of the deliberative system later on. Um, but ideally that, but I'm still talking at the ideal level now, um, but ideally it should um, in, deliberate, inclusive deliberation should be able to empower all agents, um, um, all relevant agents, um, uh, to 
in a cooperative search for what um, justice might mean in any given context. Um, second, it should be able to, deliberation should be able to reconcile competing conceptions of justice. Um, uh, this, uh, really, this is sort of building on uh, the work of um, Amartya Sen, uh, sort of well-known um, uh, uh, theorist of justice um, who argues that um, we always need to deliberate. Um, he doesn't use the term deliberation, but that's really what he means. Um, we always need to um, deliberate uh, competing conceptions of justice um, in any specific um, local case. Um, deliberation also should enable all actors to be more effective in the implementation of justice um, because it, it, it can involve them in, in sort of more effective um, political relationships, um, especially at, at local levels. Um, and it should be able to integrate different sorts of actors concerned with justice into a more effective global system of co cooperation. And this is um, the idea of um, a deliberative system. And I believe this is what is uh, this is exactly what is missing at the moment in uh, when it comes to the global governance of climate change um, and actually the global governance of, um, of, of many things. Um, and specifically, um, inclusive deliberation, and this is where we get to the inclusive part, um, should enable the recognition and effective participation of the most disadvantaged groups and individuals. Um, and that's that's probably that's 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 one of the most biggest challenges: how to organise such groups into deliberative systems. Um, and finally, um, ideally, deliberation should be able to curb the tendency to. Um, uh, which I've already referred to when it comes to powerful states um, in uh, in international negotiations, the tendency to interpret and advance justice in ways that suit material self-interest, because we know that at least in theory, um, uh, deliberation promotes um, impartiality. Um, we know that in theory. Um, we also know that in 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 practice, um, in in small scale deliberative forums, and um, we can see that um, it does promote impartiality as people have to. Uh, justify their positions uh, extensively to others uh, who, who come from different starting points. Um, all this, I mean, so this, this slide is really about, um, about, um, about what happens in, in, in theory. Um, now, what happens in, in practice, of course, can be very different, um, but I would argue that uh, we can reform practice. And here's just a um, a few, this is just a, a few ideas. Um, I've, I've, this is a bit selective um, because I actually have a, a much um, a longer list of, um, of, of possibilities. So how, can, how could we think about um, building uh, a better deliberative system when it comes to, the, uh, when it comes to, um, to climate justice and the, the, the global governance of climate change in, in general? Um, so these are these are some of the things that we can we can we could think about doing. Um, so uh, more deliberative interchanges within civil society. Uh, so I mean, civil society is an, in, is an incredibly um, lively place um, when it when it comes to um, when it comes to the global governance of climate change. Um, there are all kinds of people show up, um, all kinds of civil society groups. Um, I'm sure, for example, um, thousands of activists um, come to the. Uh, the annual conference of the the parties of the UN Framework Convention on on climate change. Um, uh, as, as as a deliberative Democrat, um, we we should be seeking um, more deliberative interchanges within civil society. So that means that that means um, uh, uh, groups with different starting points um, should not just be talking um, with 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 like minded people, but also with people who don't share their um, their their starting points. And what we often see. Um, in civil society gatherings um, in association with the annual Congress of the Parties is that um, uh, relatively moderate groups um, tend to associate with each other, more radical groups associate with each other, and there isn't, uh, often there isn't much of an interchange um, between, uh, uh, between, between, between the two sorts of groups. Um, so, um, so it, at least in the um, the approach to deliberative democracy that I would take, and I think a lot of deliberative Democrats would, would share this, um, civil society and what we sometimes call the public sphere um, is, is really a crucial site within the deliberative system. Um, it's where deliberation, it's where um, effective deliberation should, should begin. Um, so um, it shouldn't just involve, um, uh, say, political activism, which involves um, strategically trying to advance um, one's own particular interests or values. Um, it should also ideally um, involve deliberative um, interchanges um, um, and, and, and li lively discourse um, across people with, um, with very different starting points. Um, what else can we do? 
we can think about um, more deliberative forums um, involving, um, for example, um, experts, uh, public intellectuals, and lay citizens. Um, it's you know experts. Um, well, actually, I, sorry, I should also I should also um, have, have said um, deliberative forums involving not just experts, public intellectuals, lay citizens, but also civil society. Um, what we often see is that um, expert forums um, don't uh, don't necessarily connect with um, uh, with 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 lay with lay citizens, um, um, but but citizens. Um, Citizens have some key virtues, which I'll which I'll come to in a moment. Um, and I think it it's um, it would be it's it's important to try and integrate um, ordinary, ordinary lay citizens um, in 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 deliberative and in, in deliberative systems, um, along with other actors such as public intellectuals, um, experts, and civil society. Um, and we can there there, is, there has been um, so again I'll talk about this in um, in just a moment. There there have been. Um, um, some attempts to organize um, global assemblies. And the most prominent one was uh, in 20, 2021, when there was an online global assembly on the climate and ecological crisis, which um, uh, my own center at the, um, the, the U University of Canberra um, was, was one of the co-sponsors of. And my colleague, uh, Nicole Carato, was um, heavily involved in, uh, um, in organizing that online global assembly. And that was actually the, the, very, the very first um, Global Citizens Assembly um, on any, on any topic. Although, um, given COVID, it had to be online. Um, I think it, I think ideally such assemblies. Um, we we know that deliberation that's in person works much much better than online deliberation. Um, so we could think about um, global assemblies of of of, of lay citizens um, also involved in um, deliberative relationships with um, experts, public intellectuals, and members of, of civil society. And that's perhaps a a, a bigger challenge. Um, uh, we can think about uh, how to organize more direct re representation by the, the poor themselves in global deliberative systems, um, not just the advocates of the poor. Um, so organizations um, such as Oxfam, for example, are well known for the advocacy on the, the part of the poor. Uh, but it's, it, it's, it's much harder actually to get representation um, from the poor themselves in, in global processes. Um, there are... Um, Again, I'll get to this in just a moment. There are some examples we can use from the sustainable development goal process, um, which um, did try to do that. Um, but we don't generally see it when it comes to um, the climate negotiations and climate justice. Um, we, should, we, should, we, we can also think about um, applying deliberative principles to international negotiations themselves. Now, the, 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 the negotiations we see at the Conference of the Parties of the UN Framework Convention on, on Climate Change um, are often not very deliberative. Um, that they involve um, they involve bargaining as, um, as as different states or blocks of states, such as the European Union or the G seventy seven um, group of developing countries, uh, set out their positions and 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 there's a there's a kind of a strategic interchange um, between the different uh, the different powerful players. Um, but we can envisage um, more deliberative principles um, applying to international negotiations. And we actually um, see this to a certain extent in the process which yielded the Sustainable Development Goals. So the content of those goals um, was finalized um, by something called the, um, the Open Working Group, uh, which was composed of a, a relatively small number of, 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 um, of, uh, um, of, 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 uh, of, of negotiators, um, much smaller than the number that appears um, for the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, where you have um, essentially um, every state in the world is there. The the Open Working Group um, was composed of, for the Sustainable Development Goals was a, a, was composed of a much more, smaller number of states. Um, basically, anyone who wanted to be there could, um, but they were the, the number of places at the table was limited, and so um, uh, states had to organise themselves into what were called um, uh, troikas of, um, uh, uh, and then there would be one representative from each troika. Now, troika implies three, but there are actually um, in, in some in some cases there were more than three, some cases less than three. But those those states were actually sort of made up of um, uh, sometimes um, states from very different uh, very different sorts of uh, 
uh, parts of the world, um, also different different levels of income, different le different kinds of interest. And so I think there was one troika was made up of Iran, Nepal, and Japan, if I remember rightly. So they had to sort of uh, come to a common position themselves um, before uh, taking that common position into the negotiate into the negotiations, and. Uh, and the um, it, and a lot of it also had to do with the um, the the, the co-chairs of, of those negotiations, but um, but they were much more deliberative um, in terms of the kind of interchange that we, we saw between the negotiators than we see in the climate change negotiations. So it's possible to um, think of, uh, of of trying to make um, international negotiations more deliberative and less strategic. Um, we can also think um, when it comes to building deliberative systems of building deliberative accountability platforms um, uh, from negotiators to the citizens of the world. Now, negotiators um, often do try to give an account of, of what they've done in the negotiations um, in terms of um, media briefings or, or, and, and so forth. Um, but often it's just um, it's one way. Um, so it's deliberative exchanges are two way. So citizens will be able to question negotiators. Um, and it would be nice to be able to build um, accountability platforms where there is a, a two-way interchange. Um, and so, um, and these are all components of um, uh, a better deliberative system. So uh, we should not think of deliberative democratization just in terms of, say, introducing a citizens' assembly um, or whatever. We need to think about all the connections in the system, all the sites where deliberation occurs in civil society, um, in expert forums, in global assemblies of, of lay citizens, um, in international negotiations, um, in accountability platforms, and figuring out how to join all these together um, in a better deliberative system. Okay, um, and in this system, um, I think we should emphasize, um, this, this is my, my own view of what sh should be emphasized, because this is what is not there at the moment. Um, lay citizens of the world, um, the the global assembly that I referred to is really the first meaningful attempt to try to incorporate lay citizens systematically in global governance of climate change or global governance of anything, really. Um, although, I mean, the problem is that it was uh, it was very much a bottom up initiative, um, so it had no formal connection to the the, the, the UNFCCC negotiations. Um, uh, it's really important to try and figure out a way of, um, of of getting the voice of those sorts of assemblies actually heard in the the, nego the global negotiation process. Um, the poor and the marginalised, um, their voice is conspicuously missing, and when it comes to climate justice in particular, um, this is this is a crucial voice. Um, now, the experience of India. Uh, and, the, and I'm relying here on the work of um, uh, my friend uh, uh, Vijendra Rao and, and his colleagues um, who've, who've studied um, uh, uh, Gram Sabas uh, in, in India. Um, and to quote Rao and his co-author Samuel, um, he says that it's, it's the, the Gram Sabas show that the poor can deliberate. Um, there are some critics of deliberative democracy who argue that it's um, it's something only for the well-educated uh, uh, and the powerful and the relatively wealthy. Um, I think that's wrong. I think that anyone can deliberate. Um, and this is corroborated by Rao and Sandel, who, who, who argue that um, uh, the experience of Gram Sabas in rural India, especially in the south of India, um, which, the, which they've studied, um, show that the poor can deliberate effectively. Um, and to quote them, they, sh they show that this shows how, quote, deliberation shapes the meaning of poverty um, uh, for the poor themselves and how it might be alleviated. Now, that's a long way from village deliberation to global deliberation. Um, but we can actually sort of think about ways of um, trying to involve the poor more directly in, in global negotiations. Um, and we see this um, to a certain degree when it comes to the process which yielded the Sustainable Development Goals in 2015. Um, they, there was at least an effort on the part of um, the United Nations and its agencies to involve the poor directly. It didn't necessarily work out very well. Um, uh, some of the effort was um, global, but not very deliberative. So there was a, a, a survey 
uh, the My World survey, which was um, which was which was um, which was distributed and mostly had to be filled in online. Um, and there was an effort to in, in involve the poor and marginalised, but um, filling in a survey is not is not very deliberative. Um, there were some um, uh, national dialogues that were weakly deliberative and very sporadic. Um, they were in, implemented in different ways in different different countries, and uh, uh, um, most of them did not do an especially good job of incorporating the poor and marginalised. Um, the most strongly deliberative attempt to involve the poor directly in the process of the sustainable development goals um, was conducted by something called the participate initiative which was outside the un process it was in, in a sense sort of trying to um uh this try, trying to uh influence the process from the outside and the participate initiative um organized um in a number of developing countries what they called ground level panels and this was uh, in contrast to the high-level panel, which was part of the official um, UN process for the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, so ground-level panels were um, intended to um, involve the poor directly um, in deliberating um, about um, all the kinds of questions that at a very different level, a very higher global level, um, uh, would enter into the Sustainable Development Goals, um, which were really quite comprehensive um, um, in terms of their, 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 their coverage. Um, of um, well, questions of development, sustainability, just about everything that you might think could factor into um, questions of uh, of global justice. Um, but that was, um, uh, but in the end, the the problem there was not that the these panels took place. They were they were they, it was great. Um, they were extremely deliberative, um, uh, sort of very empowering for the the people who participated in, participated in them. Um, the problem was in getting that voice heard at the global level. And as far as I can tell. There was um, they they had pretty much zero influence on the uh, on the international negotiations in the context of the sustainable development goals. Um, so again, it's a matter of trying to figure out how to um, build connections um, in deliberative systems um, and finding uh, better ways um, for those at peak levels in those systems to listen uh, to what's going on at ground level, um, very literally in these um, in these ground level panels. Um, so there are other ways we could think about um, the direct participation of the poor, and um, we could recruit them directly into um, into global citizens assemblies, um, global citizens juries, and and so forth. Um, uh, we 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 could try and find a place in the deliberative, deliberative systems for poor-led transnational social movements, um, such as the, the example that everyone uses is um, La Via Campesina, which is the uh, the international peasants movement. There's also a um, a slum dwellers international um, movement, but uh, but those are the two examples everyone uses. And what that suggests is that um, uh, the, these movements are actually much uh, are much thinner on the ground. They're much less visible than uh, uh, than, than big advocacy organisations, um, which are often based in, um, um, in 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 wealthier countries. So think things like Oxfam, for example. Um, so um, finally, when it comes to um, uh, thinking about uh, the ecological dimension. Uh, of justice um, and also uh, future generations. Um, that's um, that involves um, uh, better listening, uh, listening to the signals uh, of distress uh, from the non the non human world. Um, that the, the world's dominant e e the dominant ecosystem sorry the dominant economic systems in the world the dominant political systems have really been built up. Um, uh, 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 historically, uh, in such a way that they're they're very good at um, at reinforcing their own necessity. You know, think of the capitalist market economy, and uh, um, and it's uh, it's it's uh, and, and 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 it's um, it's its own capacity to um, sort of re reinforce itself. Um, and you know, as soon as it looks as though um, it might be in trouble, it gets some um, enormous attention from governments throughout the world. Think of the global financial crisis in um, in two thousand and eight. Um, 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 huge amounts of money are quickly devoted to ensuring that the, the system survives. But with so the but, but dominant systems are so bad that um, at listening to the non human world, and so trying to figure out um, how to. Uh, to listen to what's going on when it comes to the condition of the Earth system itself and more local ecosystems um, is 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 really the is really the, the, the key here. Um, so one um, uh, one 
important development in recent years has been the at least the, the recognition of the, um, the the legal rights of, um, of, of 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 natural systems. And so, this is um, this is a picture of the the Fanganui River in New Zealand, which was one of the first um, uh, such entities to be granted legal rights and legal standing of its own. I think um, there's been a, a case um, in India where that's um, where the Ganges has been recognised um, in 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 similar terms. Um, and so this is just one small step to um, this, 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 uh, this at least this legal considerability of non-human um, entities. Um, it's at least one small step um, to listening to what's going on um, in non-human systems more effectively. Um, when it comes to future generations, it's uh, it's equally difficult because future generations, of course, do not have uh, do not have a voice uh, in the present. Um, however, we do have some evidence um, from lay citizen forums, um, so it's things like citizens assemblies, um, that um, that they actually do a much better job um, of thinking about the long term aspects of, uh, of of policy choices than do conventional uh, conventional parliamentary processes and conventional elected governments. And the reason for that is that um, lay citizen forums are free of the constraints of the electoral cycle. Uh, that elected politicians often just look as far ahead as the next election and not much further, and are not very good at thinking in um, uh, th thinking about the the long term consequences of what they're doing. Um, lay citizens organised in deliberative forums, so we have evidence um, sh that shows that they do actually do a much a much better job. Um, so, um, so I've tried to make the case um, as strongly as I can for inclusive citizen deliberation as being central to the pursuit of climate justice, uh, that this applies, um, I, I would argue, to all levels, um, from the local level to the national level and, and even the global level, and that the key is to um, organise uh, the, the, organize the peoples of the world into a more effective um, deliberative system. And so um, let, me, uh, let me finish there, and that should give us some time for questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor John Rijek. Uh, thank you so much for a very comprehensive and enlightening presentation. It was really interesting and we immensely benefited from it. Uh, now we have around 20 to 25 minutes uh, and we have received lots of questions. So without wasting much time, let me share the question with you. First is that how efficient are international organizations in mitigating climate issues? Uh, do you think that we have a functioning, robust international regime to deal with climate change? What can be done to make it better? Yeah, I mean, okay, that's that's uh, that's an enormous question. Um, I would say that um, we do not have an effective um, global regime for for dealing with 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 climate change. Um, and, and I think that's if you if you if we just look at the lessons of experience. Um, okay, climate change has been recognised as being a, 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 a crucial issue since, um, well, I, th I think really since the 1960s, you know, we, we can find references to climate change, um, for example, in US government documents in the 1960s. Um, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change was um, established in 1992, so that's 30 years now. Um, what has happened in the, in those subsequent 30 years? Well, we see... Um, uh, the trajectory of, um, of 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 global greenhouse gas emissions um, uh, uh, just continues to to rise, um, and uh, th and that's before we get to questions of, of justice uh, on on any dimension. That's just looking at the um, the the aggregate problem. Um, and so what that's what that suggests is that um, we do not currently have an effective um, an effective um, uh, global governance system. Um, so uh, what can we do about that? Well. Um, I've tried to suggest that um, making the system more deliberative um, and more inclusive um, is really the, the 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 key to improving it. Uh, but what it needs um, this is a, a slight digress digression to some other work I've done that doesn't really refer to um, justice in particular. But um, uh, the, the 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 key quality that is missing in global um, institutions is. Um, is a self-critical capacity to to reform themselves, to recognise when they're not working, um, and to uh, and try and figure out ways of doing better. 
Um, so when it comes to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, you know, we have these negotiations um, every year. Um, they're a focus of an enormous amount of energy on the part of um, governments, um, uh, international organizations, civil society, um, scientists, and so forth. Um, and what do they yield? Well, um, they, they don't... Uh, they 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 absorb a huge, huge amount of energy without um, necessarily yielding much progress. Now, sometimes they can yield um, a degree of progress. So, the um, for all its faults, um, the Paris um, Agreement in 2015 um, uh, was uh, um, uh, uh, was 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 progress of a sort. And what I would argue is that um, one one of the things which that um, the agreement reflected is was that. Um, uh, that instead of um, trying to produce a comprehensive multilateral agreement, or sorry, a com comprehensive multilateral treaty that was legally binding, which they had been trying to do for the previous um, uh, so 20, yeah, 23 years, um, that instead uh, something, a different approach needed to be taken. And so um, uh, there was a, a shift in the way the regime worked um, to what my um, our Swedish colleague um, uh, Karin Backstrand would call um, what does she call it? Um, oh, sorry, I'm blanking on the title. It's um, a hybrid multilateralism. So it joins sort of bottom up and top down approaches to governance, and that's a tiny, tiny step in rethinking uh, the, the way the system works. And what I what I would argue is that um, we need just much more like that reflection on the process itself, what's not working, and what might we do different um, when it comes to the process of governance um and so and of course i have lots of i have lots of deliberative ideas um, about um, what might be introduced but um but the key thing is just the ability of the system itself to change its own uh way of operating and um often that um that that is just very very hard that it's stuck in pathways which um uh, which are ineffective but um very entrenched uh thank you let me move to the next question like what is uh, how do you see Biden's environment policy, keeping in consideration the backward steps that was taken by previous Trump administration? Yeah. Um, okay. The, the the Biden administration. Um, I mean, clearly, it's um, it, it's its climate policy is so much better than the Trump administration's. Um, but the problem with the United States, um, uh, the problems there when it comes to climate policy, um, run really deep, and so. Um, you know, if you know, you might get a slightly more progressive presidency uh, in Biden than, than well, very much more progressive presidency than Biden you got with Trump. But then that's only for four years or maybe eight years, and who knows what comes after that. Um, and there's in, in the United States, um, you've got some uh, some inbuilt um, so, some massive structural problems. So the um, I'll just mention one of them, which is really bad, which is the. Um, the overrepresentation of um, rural states in the United States Senate. Um, rural states tend to be conservative. Um, conservatives in the United States tend to be climate change deniers. Um, so that means that um, the United States Senate is dominated by climate change deniers, even though the population of the United States is not. Um, wh why does that matter? Well, it matters because um, any global treaty um, that's meaningful needs to be ratified by the United States, and it's the Senate which um, does the ratifying. The Senate is never going to ratify uh, a treaty on climate change. Um, so that's a huge sort of inbuilt structural problem um, that the United States has, and it's a problem not just for the US, but for the world as well. Um, and so we have to, I guess then, we, you know, the challenge is, well, how, how do we figure a way around that? So um, yes, um, Biden is an improvement, um, but the United States is still uh, still highly problematic as an actor in uh, in global climate politics. Uh, thank you. Let me move to another question. Like, what are your suggestions to states for the incorporation of climate refusing? Uh, how can a global regime ensure compliance of accommodating climate refugees at a time when migration is such a taboo? Yeah. Wow, that's that's a huge question, and and, and that's that's not actually something that I've um, really tackled myself. Um, I mean, clearly, uh, uh, yeah. I mean, the, one of one of the key things is um, recognizing, yeah, re recognizing the, the the standing of 
of of climate refugees um, in, in in international law. Um, that it's it, and it's currently you know it's tough for refugees refugees from um, from armed conflicts now. Well, increasingly tough it seems to um, uh, get other states, um, especially wealthy states, um, to 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 accept um, to accept such um, to accept such refugees. Um, and I think it's going to it's it's um, it's going to be um, uh, uh, just as tough and even tougher to get those states to um, uh, to 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 accept climate climate refugees. Um, actually, even the, the I think um, I guess even the concept of climate change of climate this is a digression, but the concept of climate refugees has come in in for some um, for, to, for to be to be challenged by some people that. Um, Having said that, I can't remember exactly the exact grounds. But anyway, um, that's uh, um, yeah, that that's an enormous question, and I'm not I'm not sure I really have an answer. Um, but um, sort of trying, but it's a, that's going to be an enormous challenge, um, I think, in 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 future years. Uh, so let me uh, move to Nepal. There are lots of questions on Nepal and in case you want to add uh, to that. Uh, like despite contributing only 0.027% of the total global emission, Nepal is paying a huge cost for mm. climate change. How important is equity as a component in climate policy? What yeah. should be the actual interest of a small country like Nepal concerning climate change? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's um, that that is such... Um, uh, yeah, that's such an important question. That the equity of of that sort should be essential to climate justice, um, and and as as the question as the question points out, I mean Nepal has contributed a well an infinitesimal uh, proportion of the uh, of, of the greenhouse gas emissions which have yielded um, uh, yielded climate change, um, and yet is um, is is suffering um, disproportionately as a result. And of course, it's not just Nepal; it's um, it's um, um, it's 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 many other um, many other countries are in a, in a similar kind of situation. But getting um, getting the wealthier countries of the world um, to 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 recognise that is an enormous challenge. Um, and so, how do you do that? Well, and this is where I. Uh, you know, this is where I, I sort of do hold hold out hope um, for engaging um, those countries in in more deliberative relationships. Because as long as those those countries, the powerful countries, um, see international negotiations um, mainly in terms of um, a pursuit of their own material interests, then it's very very hard um, for the equity case from um, from countries like Nepal to to get a hearing. Um, but um, uh, but I, I I do hold out hope, and, and this this is I mean in, in many ways the, the sort of the main sort of theme of my my talk um, that we can construct more deliberative relationships in in global governance, and I think the sustainable development goals um, process, which I've mentioned a few in a few places, um, for all its problems and falling short in in many in many many kinds of ways, um, uh, does does show how global process can be more deliberative um that there are uh, well i mean the, the, there are sort of questions there about um you know what what sort of effects um what sort of real world effects will the, the sustainable development goals have and that's another question entirely but at least in the process of their formulation they show that relationships can be more deliberative and i think um show that um questions of equity um can get um can get addressed so there are lots of questions on Nepal, which I'll skip, but maybe I'll just share with you, like there are lots of questions that Nepal is sandwich, sandwiched between two world's uh, biggest polluter, India and China. Without their interest, we cannot adopt emission-free technology as we have become more dependent on them. So if, amongst uh, this backdrop, how can we initiate addressing the impact of climate change happening in Nepal? And similarly, there are other questions like, Amidst the intensifying politics of the North-South divided climate change negotiations, how can Nepal be able to arc articulate its interest? There's another yeah. interesting question that I'd like to share, and then maybe you can put uh, uh, your perspective together. Like, can international institutions deal efficiently when the problem of climate change, uh, considering the internal problems of fragmentations and deadlock? Uh, should we rethink the model of in international institutions uh, for example, moving beyond the national state and reaching a world state, uh, 
considering the European Union, whether you would consider the recent measures, for example, the European Green Deal as sufficient and why not? Right. Okay, so those, um, let's make some notes here. Um, yeah, I mean, the question of um, what kind of influence can Nepal exercise um, when it comes to glo global negotiations? Um, I, th I think the answer there is, um, well, I mean, there's two answers, really. Um, one is um, that it can join blocks of countries. And I think, I, I assume Nepal is a member of the, the G77 group of developing countries. And so um, joining a block means um, that at least it's um, possible to get um, uh, uh, to, to be part of something that has a voice, although, of course, the danger there is that the specific voice of Nepal um, then is maybe get lost, maybe gets lost in the larger larger um, voice of the, of the G77. Um, but a number, but um, uh, one other way of, of thinking about it is um, if we think about, um, uh, for example, the um, the small island states um, organized into IOSIS, the Association of, um, of Small Island States. Um, together, they cover a tiny fraction of the world's population, and yet they, they are quite, they're, 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 they're quite visible um, in the international negotiations. Now, their voice is not decisive, but at least it does get heard. And I think it's because they, they have a kind of moral authority that everyone can look at them and think, wow, yeah, they 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 are really on the front lines of um of, of climate change and so i think um um so so countries like nepal for example um could could um uh, could could try and do something similar in in terms of um in, in terms of trying to establish a, a a kind of a moral authority um the problem with moral authority is it only gets listened to uh, to the degree uh international governance uh global governance um is based on um uh, sort of more ethical principles, um, what I would call deliberative principles, um, which of course most of the time it it isn't, and that um, uh, that 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 sort of a uh, gets me into an answering the, um, uh, the 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 other question about well, um, is is the global the current system of global governance on um, on things like climate change um, adequate? Um, I, I think clearly um, clearly it's not, um, but then. You know, we could imagine things, you know, there are people who propose um, much stronger institutions of global government, and there are some people who, who do propose the idea of, a, of, a, of something like a, a global state, but that just, that just doesn't seem, um, that just doesn't seem feasible at the a, a global, anything like a global state doesn't seem um, uh, remotely feasible at the moment, um, you know, think, think of the um, well, just the rivalries between the um the well between the superpowers um that um it's it's hard to see that that happening. So this is um um and and, and so this is why we have to sort of you know th you know try and think creatively of um of 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 way, ways um ways to move move systems forward. Um, and it's easy to be pessimistic and think ah oh, uh, you know we we've got this global governance system on climate change and other issues um it, it doesn't produce what it needs to um it moves incredibly slowly it seems it's just very hard to reform itself um but then we we can occasionally look um there are a few moments in history where there has been um a very rapid movement um in 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 global governance so um so thinking for example of um um you know, the, the the process which set up the United Nations in 1945, um, essentially a conference in um, in in San Francisco, um, and that just very quickly set up the United Nations system. Um, around the same time, um, the um, the the Bretton Woods negotiations um, again in in the U.S., which set up the um, the the world's financial system, the, uh, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, and uh, so forth, um, which we're still living with today. Um, so there are occasionally these moments of um, of um, transformative change. Now, the problem is that those moments in the past have only ever occurred uh, after a world war, um, the same after World War, world, the First World War. Um, so the question is, um, can we envisage such um, constitutional moments um, somehow occurring without the uh, the cat catastrophe of a world war? Of course, we're faced with climate catastrophe, but the problem with climate catastrophe compared to a world war is it's slow moving, slow moving. It doesn't, there's no kind of, you know, immediate end to the war, 
thinking, okay, now what's the new system? Um, it's not, the climate change is not like that. And so that's, um, um, so that's an enormous challenge um, when it comes to um, sort of rethinking uh, or, or restructuring the, um, uh, the system of global governance. Um, I mean, clearly it needs doing, uh, but how do we how do we how do we find these uh, sort of these 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 kind of transformative possibilities? Um, but I, I I I really don't. I mean, I don't have any kind of compelling answer to that one. Uh, thank you, Professor. We're running out of time. We hardly have three minutes, but still there are lots of questions. I think around twenty or thirty. So let me uh, uh, club three questions: one on China, one on India, another on ASEAN. How the developed countries are contributing in in negating the climate crisis, will China agree considering its position on economic sphere? That is one on China. Second is how India would play a role in international stage concerning climate change. That is on India. And third is that can regional groupings such as ASEAN play a greater role including, uh, in including the marginalized uh, in climate justice deliberations? Right, okay. Yeah, okay, that's some big questions. Um, yeah, the, the question of, of, of course, what China does is going to be um, massively um, important. Um, and uh, actually, I've, I've argued, I remember arguing to my, to some of my Chinese friends long ago, um, that the climate change um, was was actually an opportunity for, for China in global governance. It wasn't just a problem, it was an opportunity. Um, because um, we, th this was a time when the United States was um, clearly leading the um, uh, was was clearly the dominant power in the world order, um, but the climate, but the United States, um, for reasons I talked about um, um, in response to an earlier question, is, um, is is really paralyzed when it comes to climate change, and so this was an opportunity for climate, for China to take um, the lead, um, the progressive lead on a a global issue. Um, of course, China has been an important player, but it didn't quite. Um, take the lead on the issue in the the way that uh, uh, that I, I I was was hoping uh, might be might might be possible, um, and so what what of course what China does is is just incredibly important, and I think um, China realizes uh, that the climate change is, is 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 going to be an enormous problem for itself um, that uh, that there there there, there will be um, some potentially um, uh, catastrophic developments um, for, for for China unless some unless something is really done about it. But but of course in in China there are all, there are also many interests and sort of very strong interests, um, developmental interests, um, uh, coal industry interests, which um, move which uh, perhaps um, coal industry inter interests in particular, uh, which um, which get in the way of um, effective. Um, uh, effective implementation of measures to combat um, climate change. Um, uh, the, the case of um, India, I mean, I'm hesitant to sort of speak. <laughs> I, I know there are, there are many people from uh, India in the uh, um, in the audience, and I, I'm not an expert in India at, at all, so I'm sort of a bit hesitant to um, to, to say much um, much about it. Um, uh, but but um, you know my. Um, I, I, I guess my, my my hope would be that there are there are ways of sort of finding um, uh, sort of developmental models um, which um, emphasise um, renewable energy, which um, are climate friendly, um, and uh, and and don't uh, involve uh, compromising on uh, on 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 development. Um, when it comes to um, the role of um, regional groupings such as um, ASEAN. Um, Yes, I, I think those those sorts of groupings uh, could be potentially important when it comes to um, uh, in, involving the the, the the poor and marginalized um, and providing a sort of a conduit um, to global governance for them. Um, I don't again, I, I'm not an expert on ASEAN, so I don't know if they're doing uh, anything on that um, already. Um, um, my, my guess is that they're probably they, they're probably not, but I, I would be delighted to be proved wrong. Um, I think the, the European Union shows the importance of, um, of regional groupings um, in, in processes of global governance. Um, but the, uh, I mean, the EU, um, it's more progressive than the United States, um, less progressive than it might be um, on, uh, on questions of um, climate governance and climate justice in particular. Uh, Professor John Dryjet, thank you so much for a very interesting discussion on very important issues like climate change, which is of global concern. We are really grateful for your valuable time. I, on behalf of NICE and our audience, would like to thank you for your kind presence. We hope to have in real uh, sometime. 
very soon. We also like to thank all our audience for their wonderful questions. Thank you. Good, good night in Australia and have a nice day to all our audience. Yeah, okay. And thank you. Uh, yeah, I enjoyed the questions.